Um, my name is Jesse Tory, and this is my son, Jack. Uh, my daughter wanted me to make sure I started by saying that I'm neither a lawyer or a financial planner. I'm leaving all that information to John, who will introduce himself in a few minutes. Um, what I am, not a lawyer, not a financial planner, but I'm a mother of a child with cerebral ALD. And I'm gonna share just a little bit of Jack's story with you. Jack was diagnosed in 2007, following months and months of wrong diagnoses. Oh, don't make that face. Um, but we finally managed to find a doctor who was willing to do an MRI. 10 days following the MRI, we finally received the news that Jack had adrenal leukodystrophy. A month later to the day, Jack had a bone marrow transplant. Um, the stem cells coming from a donated cord. And we were very fortunate that um, although the disease was quite progressed, the transplant was successful and it did stop the progression of the disease. But we had taken Jack to the hospital and he could still um, speak and his life was complicated, but fairly typical. By the time we brought him home, he um, was not only medically fragile, but he had a lot of disabilities. So we were thrown into this whole new world. A year after his diagnosis, we found a wonderful school for children with multiple disabilities. And that school helped Jack a huge amount in um, figuring out new approaches to some skills he had lost. Um, he loved it there, right? The PG Chamber School. And the school also did a lot for our family as we reached a place of acceptance and got used to this new world that we'd been thrown into. And one of the things they did was they had a speaker series um, about financially and legally planning um, for special needs families. And my husband and I signed up and the first question that was asked, I found this on oh, the, web. the first, sorry, checked at that. Um, the first question that they asked us was whether or not we had a will. And my husband and I were very proud that we actually were responsible and raised our hands. But the second question was whether that will had taken into account that our son had special needs. And my husband and I looked at each other and I tried to rack my brain, but my suspicion that the $99 legal Zoom will that we had taken off the internet, um, we suspected it probably didn't take into account that our son had special needs. So we learned the importance um, of we had focused so much for a year plus on keeping Jack as healthy as he could be. And we were worried about all the health ramifications about what had just happened, but hadn't focused on the other part of life. And we promised Jack back in 2007 that we were going to give him the best life that we had the power to, and part of that was preparing. And the speaker series went on um, to not just talk about wills, but talked about life insurance, talked about um, guardianship once Jack turned 18, um, applying for social security and Medicaid. It was a huge education that we didn't even know we needed. And I'm forever grateful that we signed up for that series because it was a lot of hard work to get everything organized and done. It was um, expensive, uh, not just the money, but it was emotionally rather exhausting to have to prove 
again and again that um, Jack's disabilities were profound and long-term, but we're really glad that we have done everything we could so that now we can just go back to enjoying Jack's beautiful smile and, um, and enjoying our days. So when Kathleen told me that they were planning this, I applauded them because I think it's a really important thing that often gets forgotten. And we have this incredible specialist here today. John, would you like to introduce yourself? Sure. Hi, I, I, my name is John Nadwerney. And um, I have a son, James, who is now uh, 29. Um, he has Down syndrome. He's a, um, has a uh, nonverbal, um, needs support with all his ADLs. And he smiles a lot, just like Jack. <laughs> <laughs> he brings joy to us every day. Um, so um, as Jess mentioned, um, I've been working with families like mine, like yours, for, for 27 years now. And um, I'm here to share whatever I can. It's, I think, I believe it's 20 minutes or so we'll speak. Um, I have a presentation, um, high, high, very high level. Um, my objective is to give you some basics um, and needless to say, in 20 minutes, we spent a lifetime um, addressing these issues. Um, but I think I'll be able to, I think, touch upon what we call the ma main factors. Um, I'm with my, my daughter, Alex. Um, and unfortunately for you, you have me speaking today. My daughter, Alex, an emergency came up. She couldn't speak. Um, but I can share my screen. I believe I should, hopefully folks can, uh, let's see. Is it shared now? No. no, yes, now it is. Okay, so that's the team. And Cindy had that, she has a brother um, with disabilities. She's his uh, uh, rep payee and power of attorney. And um, that's me on the right. Um, so and I, the other thing too, is that you might notice, um, I hope you have patience with me. I do have a Boston accent. I know people around the world. So that's hope, hopefully that's all right. Um, the other thing is we'll, we'll talk today on some high level pieces. We talk about what we'll call the five factors of special needs planning. Um, we can talk briefly on housing, the ABLE account at the end. I'm sure there may be questions on that. Um, the other piece too, we did, we wrote a book in 2007. Actually the timing was interesting with Jeff, Jess mentioned that's when the book was published called the special needs planning guide. And at that time when Cindy and I wrote the book, um, there was basically nothing written on the topic. Um, I'm back in college and in high school, whenever you did a research paper, you'd go back when I was there, go to the library. Now you research thing online. And then basically there was really nothing, nothing to research. And the good news is a lot of folks um, are now dealing with the, dealing with helping families address their long-term financial needs. And the and lawyers are now dealing with the legal matters and there are some solutions in helping you plan. Um, the, what it's really all about in planning is striking a balance. Um, you really have to use both government resources as well as personal resources to plan for the future of your child. What we developed when we uh, began this is we call the special needs planning timeline. Um, in our case, at James's birth, we realized that we had a unique life and I understand your situation, um, your life changes instantly for you, but there's somewhere along the timeline where you do begin to be introduced to a new world. And I think the timeline gives you what we call different pressure points. Um, so in early years, zero to three, you have what's called early intervention. Um, and that's a federal program that pretty much immerse the child with support. And then at age three to age 14, um, that's when people typically begin what's called transition planning. If my understanding, some of these folks may get your diagnosis later in life in most cases. So somewhere you will be fit along this timeline. And it's important for you to recognize that at these different periods in, in time, there are th some action items that you have to take place. Um, so what, what typically happens is that your child will be in school 
just as Jess mentioned, she was fortunate to find a school that was very appropriate for her. Um, the key thing is during the school years, you do have entitlements. Every state is different in terms of the type of education requirements that they have, or the type of entitlements that they have. But truly there are entitlements that your child is, is, is receives services from, from the school districts. The biggest point, pressure point you'll be dealing with though is at age 18. At age 18 is a point where a child becomes an adult in terms of the benefit, benef benefits for government, terms of government benefits. So at age 18, your son or daughter, if they're qualified, will be eligible for SSI, uh, Medicaid. And the key here is though, Medicaid, if most people look at Medicaid as just as a medical benefit. It is medi basically Medicaid provide significant resources to people with disabilities. Um, at age 18, you have to make the decision, will there be guardianship? Um, it's healthcare proxies. It's really very important at age 18, what happens since your child becomes an adult that day, technically, if something happens to your child where he or she has to go in the hospital, technically, you can no longer speak to him or her. That's why guardianship is so important to look at at age 18, because you do become the legal voice of a child at that point. At age 18, Medicaid begins. Um, and then what we highlight here, we highlight the typical planning, the typical family starts to think about college. Um, our worlds are much more complex. And then between age 18 and age 22, it's important to start to think about transition. The transition period is important because you go from a world of entitlements with the education system to at age 22, there's technically no entitlements other than Medicaid. Um, and so that's why it's important during this time period to learn how to advocate, um, to know, to understand the system um, and really begin to build relationships with folks in the community. Um, at age 22, you begin to think about residential employment. Um, and I can say that you know, my wife has been a real trailblazer and James is employed. Um, James, he needs help with pretty much, it, it, James's daily routine is he gets up now, two days a week, he has supported employment. Um, at nighttime comes home, we, we, we at the table, I, I um, we help him. I, he tells me, I, I cut his, if we have chicken, I basically help with all the food, fooding with him at nighttime. My role is so I shower him, um, put him to bed. And, and it, it, even now it's interesting, it's amazing. At age 29, he still requires that I kiss him. So my point why I'm saying this to you is James has significant support needs, but he is employed. Um, so never, never say it will never happen because it hit, did in our case and it can happen in yours too. Um, we planning for his residential, we, Right now, we did a lot of planning, thinking about that. Um, but right now, he's home with us. We really enjoy him being home. At some point, we did planning. We realized that we will no longer be able to care for him as we do today. So we do have a long-term planning strategy in our back pocket. But quite frankly, I couldn't see being without him. Um, and then the last part we have to think about is our personal retirement. When we were age 65, the goal is to retire. At that point, um, after that is the estate distribution when we die. Um, as Jess mentioned, um, the part where she really um, learned at the beginning with special needs trust, special needs planning, she did for her son, Jack, and we'll, and we'll talk about that. But this is a highlight, um, almost per se, a roadmap that I think you should all look to. The pressure points, key pressure points, age 18, age 22, major times in your life where you really have to begin to advocate. Um, the uh, next, next topic would be, when Cindy and I wrote the book, we began to think about what, what, what we all have to really truly plan for and what's involved in plan planning for our child. Um, one thing for sure, it's not all about the money. Um, obviously money and resources are really important. Neither is it about the wills or trust. They're important, they come into play when we die. There are really truly five factors that we 
deal with when we work with families um, in the planning process. Um, and the first is emotional. And in our case, you know, right at the beginning when James was born, we knew we, our world was going to be different. I understand in your case, you, you were going down the typical roadmap of traditional planning is thinking about college, thinking about you know, planning to get your house and all that. And then your roadmap was changed quite quickly. And emotionally, that's, that's a challenge. And I, and I was speaking with Jess, um, and in our situation, we knew, but James had a, a diagnosed, James had an extremely significant seizure disorder when he turned one. And it was um, probably one of the worst, it was clearly a challenging experience. Um, when I went to the hospital, he was there. I was a, a runner and I did some triathlons. I had my running watch on me. And the doctor said, well, count how many seizures he has. Well, I was counting one every, every second. Well, basically one every other second, actually. I had my stopwatch. I think I don't need a stopwatch. There were just significant seizures. And he went through a period of time. They were uncontrollable. And one day, and I will never, never forget this in the hospital, um, I was in there. And, they, and, and the Children's Hospital of Boston, they have these little rooms where they have ice cream and they have hoodsies and they have the fruit punch and all. And I'm in there thinking that he, there was a spot possibility of him qualifying for brain surgery. And I thought, this is incredible. I'm hoping that he qualifies for brain surgery. I never thought that I would see myself in a situation hoping that he qualifies for something as radical as brain surgery and emotionally, it was, it was really difficult. Um, and in our case, fortunately, the, you know, the seizure slowly went away. Um, and, but the point being is in planning for our children and our families, undoubtedly emotions come into play. And that has to be appreciated, especially when we work with families, we truly understand the process and how, how we slowly begin to address our changing world. Um, from financial piece, um, is another really important factor into play. Obviously, money is important. Um, government benefits, as I highlighted before, age 18 is a big, big, big bridge point. That's where you get SSI. I'll, I'll kind of highlight them in a little more detail in a few minutes. Um, the other part is legal factors, as Jess mentioned, wills, trusts, uh, family and support factors. Um, I'm looking at the, the website for, for, for ALD this morning. I recognize that you have to really build a team of mostly medical professionals. In planning, it's really important to build a team of support people around your child that while you're here, find the advocates, right people, and then while you're no longer here, building a team who can carry on. And I can say after dealing with families for many, many years, um, it really isn't money. It, money is one thing, the most wealthy people are not able in some cases to provide the best life for their child. It really truly takes a team of people to build a community around your child to give him or her the best life. So it's really important to start to think about that um, earlier, um, getting to the supports, getting people familiar, the neighborhood, community. It's critically important to really have your, we felt basically for, in our lives, it's so important to have the community. It, in James, uh, my wife, Susan, has been a major, very strong advocate. And when James goes out, he's nonverbal, and he really can't express where he's been for the day. But when he's in our community, there are many eyes on him. Many, many people know James. It is awesome. We will get reports back. They saw James here. They saw James there. Mm -hmm. Sometimes not the most pleasant reports that they find. Some support people that may be with him, may not be doing the things we do. But there are always eyes on James when he's out. That's why it's so important to have community and family support factors. Um, I believe we'll have time for questions after too. So I'm kind of going through quickly here. So the, the legal factors, how do I plan for I'm no longer make my own decisions? Um, what options my child turns 18? Those are some of the considerations we'll talk about. The legal factors to look at, you really have to identify a, an attorney who specializes in this. A lot of times that you folks who deal with elder law also deal with special needs. Um, 
So it's the key documents that we'll talk about momentarily. And you have to really, it's an important thing to work collectively with a financial advisor and attorney. Some people always ask, well, what do I do first? The financial piece, the legal piece. A lot of times um, it may be most effective if you at least put all your financial matters together first. Think about who key players are. You, you will see in your life and you're no longer able to prepare for the meeting you have with the lawyer. But some of the most basic planning documents that pretty much everyone requires would be a, a will, a healthcare proxy, power of attorney. Um, on top of that, folks will need to think about special needs trust. Special needs trust comes into play um, in maintaining government benefits for your son or daughter. In order to be eligible for SSI or Medicaid, the child can, for SSI in particular, they can't have more than $2,000 in their name. So for that reason, the special needs trust comes into play. In the, when, for, so you can have money in a special needs trust specifically for the benefit of your child, and they will not be disqualified for benefits. At age 18, if you have more than $2,000 in the bank account in his or her name, they, be, they become disqualified for SSI. It was very important at age 18, make sure the child doesn't have any money in his or her name. They have another trust called Over Trust, which is a trust that can be set up if the child does have resources in, in his or her name. There are some emergency planning techniques that he can take. And let me stress this too, is that here's, a, here's an exact case I had. We got a call from a woman who was really disappointed and discouraged because her son, she found out that someone left her son $100,000 in their will. And she called up discouraged and distraught. And I said, well, that's a pretty good problem to have. <laughs> so the point here is that there are plenty of techniques that you can use in the event of mistakes like this. In this particular case, we were able to use what's called an over trust or first party trust. And that money was, was put in this trust. And once the trust is funded, the child regains eligibility for SSI. So there, so this is called the payback trust. The government gets reimbursed for money that's spent on the child. But my point being here is that there's always techniques that you can do if you think you made a mistake. Don't worry about it. There was techniques that are there. The other piece you have to think about would be guardianship and alternatives to guardianship. A guardianship would be if his son or daughter can't make decisions for him or herself, it's recommended to have a full guardianship. There are other alternatives. If your child does have ability to make their own decisions, you can have a power of attorney. So, so it, it's really important to work with someone who understands the pluses and minuses of each of the different options that you have. Um, the uh, government benefit factors, um, it's important, how do I identify, maximize, protect child's eligibility for government benefits? And when we look at government benefits, there, there are two types, two big picture types of government benefits. You have the entitlement programs. They're funded by the federal government. That's SSI. That's Medicaid. Um, that would be also, there would be Section 8 programs, that uh, housing programs that they're eligible for. Those are the those are federal government pro programs that are entitled to if your son or daughter qualifies, number one, and also if they do not have the $2,000 in their name. So all the planning at age 18 deals with these type of entitlement programs. The non-entitlement programs are programs that are funded by the state governments and which are appropriated by each state. So the process happens through school child is eligible for education as entitlements to school by local districts. And then at age 22, that, those, that education entitlement stops. Back up a minute at age 18, the entitlement for federal government begins. At age 22, most states age 22, they lose the education entitlement. Then from there is the non-entitlement funded by state by the state. That can be housing, that can be day programs, but again, it's important. These programs are funded by government appropriation. Um, throughout the country, um, the uh, Medi Medicaid 
Um, it's funded that each, each state receives some Medicaid money and each state works differently with how the reimbursement through Medicaid and that comes at age 22 and beyond. Um, so it's key to have no more than $2,000 in a child's name. You have to watch for guardianship. And, and um, these are some basic entitlement programs. I, I think I might, um, for lack of, uh, I want to just highlight the key points here we, I'll be talking about, can, can be very conscious about time. Um, the financial factors to look at, will there be enough money? How much money will it take me to have my child have a good life and where will the money come from? And what we always do here, we develop this framework that for each, each family should look at things in allocating how their time is. Um, when folks assess themselves, um, and why, let me back up, why, why we bring this up is we get calls frequently from families, and I think it's really important I get some type of sense in terms of where you sit in terms of help you prioritize your own personal financial goals. Um, in some situations, you may have uh, worked extremely hard, have somewhat limited means, in that particular case, you, sh you should really truly spend all of your time focusing on how do I maximize my government benefits? And they definitely will be a primary source of money will be government benefits. If folks have modest wealth, um, but government benefits will be the core, but we would be encouraged to think, well, how can I supplement? How can I have funds available to supplement and enrich my child's life? And that would be involved having smart funds set aside for trips for your son or daughter, to have a uh, day out, day, days out, any type of supplemental benefits on top. If you people have significant wealth, um, you may consider having government benefits be um, the supplemental need, but if family money, family resource being primary. Why I'm mentioning this is that it is really important to think about control. Um, it's having person planning and thinking about having your own personal resources truly does it give you control over your sons and daughters destiny, not having to be totally dependent upon the various government benefits. So at one point in life, many years ago, people would say, well, my son and daughter is all taken care of. If I pass away, don't worry about it. Well, it, the fact is, is that the number of people with disabilities are growing and it's becoming bigger, bigger burdens on the gov on government. It's really important to think about how can I position myself, if possible, to be, have the greatest control with, for my own resources. And then the last people at high net worth. As I mentioned before, though, the fact of the matter is money doesn't buy happiness for our children. It's the other factors that have to pull together. And the other, uh, let's see here. Uh, the other piece would be the emotional, as I mentioned before, the emotional factors come a really important parts that come into play in terms of the, uh, how do I, at what point do I begin to deal with? The other piece called the letter of intent. Um, on our website, you can get a letter of intent. The letter of intent is so important. What that does, that describes, and that pulls into play all the people that are important in your child's life, your child's sons and dislikes. Critical, critical document that will have you lay things out. The best analogy I always say, if, you, if you're thinking about going away for let's say a weekend, in many cases, if we can't just get up and leave. But if you were to go away for a weekend, I can guarantee you, and you had someone come in, I can, on the top of your refrigerator, there will be an itinerary of things, whoever that care provider will be doing that, that would take care of things during the day. Likes and dislikes, you know, um, foods, preferences, whatever it is, that would be, you'd end up writing up a note. I can only tell you too, in my particular case, when my wife Susan goes away, I get the list. <laughs> I, I'm, just, I, I'm, I'm the dad, but all I can say is that Susan, Susan has a comprehensive list of things that I have to do, I have to rem remember to do. Thank God she has that list. What the letter of intent does, it enables you, it prompts you to think about all those things that someone we, we pick up this document if you were to walk out, you weren't here, what would someone do? And the letter of intent is this key document to do that. And the other piece would be transfer of roles and responsibilities. It talks about that, talk about family meetings. Um, and we'll talk further about family support factors. The, the key here is like, also communication is really key when you're talking to all, the, all your team members. Um, the family support factors. 
we say, who will fill my shoes? Um, and one of the key things that we, we've been really dealing with is, especially um, when my daughter Alex uh, joined our, our practice, it really does look at, we really do feel it's important for family members and friends. I think at some point we deal closely with siblings. Um, and the other piece too is that in many situations, it may be an only child. Um, not that there were many, many planning strategies that we do to deal with. If you have your only child with person with disabilities, it's critically important at that point too, too to create your own, to, to build your own team. The team in our case, we, we, we are truly part of our clients' teams. Thanksgiving time in the past has been a big time where we meet with siblings. Siblings fly in from around the country. On th typically on Wednesday night before Thanksgiving, we usually at someone's house when the other family members come in, they get they get to identify, well, this is this is this this is how things will happen when the parents are no longer here. It's a whole in many cases, it's it's remember said before about emotionally planning. This takes time to think to think about this. We have clients we work with for years and years and years, and finally they say, now it's time to get my other siblings a little bit more involved. And what's interesting, what's been really fun with my daughter being with me is that parents always say, we, we as parents, we say, I really don't want to quote burden my children, my siblings with, with, well, with all the things that we've had to deal with with James. Fact here is that they want to be part of the process. They really want to be part. They really want to be involved. And the, oh, I say Thanksgiving, Thanksgiving dinner a number of years ago, when I, I'm planning, this has been my career, my daughter let me have it in terms of saying that you have to let us know, you have to be involved. I say, oh, it's all set, don't worry about it, we're all set. I think, you know what, I had the money piece, I had the wills piece, I had all that. I did have the most important piece, that was them on board, they want to be on board. So pretty much building a team to carry on, again, doesn't have to be siblings, they're professionals. You know, Alex was part of this team called the Mass Guardianship Association. Other states have guardianship associations but take the time to identify key people. One other story here it, and that I'd like to share with you. And, it, it, and it, one of my clients was began without, it, in the, prior to working with us, she asked one of her friends if they would be their son's guardian. And this son was medically extremely challenging and the person said no. And I said to the, my client said, in some respects, do you blame them? And to put this on someone without a team, to put this on someone without really knowing what they're dealing with, in some respects, they did them a favor to say no. Um, however, we'll, now we've worked with her, we've been rest assured that there are people that this person can count on. And the concept of the team is, be important for you to identify someone, I would call the captain of the ship. You have resources, you have, you have your plan set in place, you have a special needs trust set in place, you have resources set in place. You should identify a captain of the ship who will be there, not to, not to do everything you do, not to cut James's stake at him at night, not to brush James's teeth, but to make sure that there are people there that do that. This captain of the ship finds resources that are necessary in building this team and finding people if they don't do the job. But having a plan in place with the continuum team is so important for, for our children. So I will leave the formal presentation of that. Hopefully I've opened some time for questions. Um, if that's okay, uh, Jess, how are we doing with time? Is this, let me I know. Think I We have about five minutes. I wanted to say that people can certainly write questions in that little question box and would be happy to answer them. But I wanted just to expand on something that you mentioned, John. The letter of intent was something that I had never heard of before that speaker series all those years ago. But that's something that you all as parents can do today. Start working up. It, and we treat it, I go back every couple of months and fine tune it because life changes and we have new therapists that are coming to the house and 
all that contact information that lives in my brain and on my calendar, but I act as if, if I'm not here, how can people get in touch with all these people? What does Jack's schedule look like? And so many of us with ALD have huge teams of doctors and therapists and teachers. It's just really valuable to have that. And that's something you can get going on before you meet with a lawyer like yourself or a financial planner. A letter of intent is super important. I just want to throw that out there. Are there, if there are any questions, the only question I had seen was somebody asked about Jack's hearing and vision. Jack's disease actually started in the front of his brain. Um, he never lost his hearing or vision. Um, and we're grateful because he loves music and art and pretty girls. So I don't see any other questions, John. Is there anything else you wanted to add? Well, one, one question people almost always ask are ABLE accounts. The ABLE account that people heard about that, the ABLE account um, is a uh, savings account, an investment account that's set up. Every Most states have one. Um, what it does, it enables you to say, put aside up to $15,000 a year in an account um, where the assets do not disqualify a son or daughter for government benefits. Um, and, and they pretty much allow you to spend what's called the qualified expense. So you can use the account to pay for any the supplemental expenses, supplemental expenses. The money grows tax-free as long as it's used to pay for, uh, by, the by the qualified uh, individual. Um, so that would be important. The other, other thing too is that most, most people always ask, when should I fund my special needs trust? Most of the time, uh, you will fund your special needs trust through your will at your death, rather than funding it during your lifetime. If, unless someone has significant wealth, um, that's, that's usually when you do it. The other piece, if you do have any questions, or you can send us an email. Um, I know this was an extremely high level presentation, hopefully touch, touch on some topics. Um, and our website's called specialfinancialplanning.com. Uh, um, and we have a lot of resources on our website. Um, and it's there to be downloaded. We have a blog. You can, you can, if you'd like, you can sign up for our blog. Um, and my name is John Nadworny, N-A-D-W-O-R-N-Y. Enter that into the internet. You'll, you'll see our firm. And we you can call us if you have any basic questions. We'd be more than happy to... Um, folks who are listening to the, today's talk. And um, hopefully I was helpful to you all and appreciate you taking the Saturday to, um, to hear me and um, that's it. Wonderful. Enjoy. Well, thank you for everyone who was listening and thank you so much, John, for all your expert advice. Appreciate it, Jessica. Could have used you 13 years ago. Well, sounds like you've done a fine job anyway. Uh, but Jack, it all worked like, out. You got a really happy guy, right? I sure do. <laughs> Enjoy your son, and we'll see everybody else later in the day. Thank, Thank you, folks. You. Bye now. Bye. Bye. -bye.